Brett Herbert. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be back at CCMA, and I'm very much aware that the last time I was here was at Albuquerque in 2005. I'm reminded of that because that's what it says on my La Montanita co-op food market ball cap that I have from the Albuquerque <laughs> conference. It's a great ball cap, by the way. Um, CCMA is a really special group um, for a variety of reasons. I know that the, what inspires me the most about cooperatives is the distinctive way that co-ops combine idealism and pragmatism. And at a conference like this, I think you've got it all. People are here to talk about how to change the world, and they're here to go to workshops that are about um, how to use spreadsheets for financial marketing, how to use better techniques uh, for, uh, for management and for member education. And I think that's right on. That's terrific. So CCMA conferences are really exciting. There's always a huge amount of energy in the room. And it's a pleasure to be here. And as I've told a number of you, I learn from the interactions every time I come to a conference, and that the CCMA especially. Uh, my topic for today, in a word, is really change. Uh, it's about how the world is changing. It's about what that means for co-ops. And it's about how co-ops of many different kinds are changing, and what are some of the lessons we can take from that. Uh, yesterday, I heard uh, Mari Gallagher in the opening plenary uh, talk about the need for co-ops to revisit your mission and to stretch. And you'll see that that concept of stretch is something that I want to talk to you about this morning as well. So these are turbulent times, um, and we see that in all kinds of ways. Uh, this is an era of intense globalization. By one calculation, uh, since uh, 1955, international trade has increased by 100 times around the world. And with that has gone the globalization of markets, the globalization of financial markets in particular. And as we've seen since 2008, that also means global bubbles in real estate and in finance that have affected everybody in every part of the world in each of your communities and in mine. We've seen changes in the fortunes of industries and of countries. If you think about uh, countries like uh, Iceland, like Ireland, the way that they were hit in the opening phases of the global recession, more recently Greece and Portugal and Spain, a huge turmoil. So countries that rely on particular mixes of industries are particularly exposed. Uh, there's political unrest, there's uh, social and economic discord. And the political turmoils also include other uh, fascinating um, um, uh, events whose meaning, I'm sure, will only become clear over time. But I think it's possible that the uh, youth rebellions in the Arab world that we see today, if I can characterize them that way, may turn out to be among uh, the most important global events in the early parts of the 21st century. Economic turmoil, political ferment, um, and ideas that spread around the world in new ways. Ideas about global governance, about common environmental issues that cross our boundaries. Um, and I would also add, in terms of the economic impacts, we see growing disparity between rich and poor. I mention that particularly. I know it's an issue um, in the United States. Uh, measures of disparity between uh, the wealthy and the poor uh, have been increasing in the United States, as in a variety of other countries, but are particularly acute in this country compared to many other developed countries. So these are turbulent times. That affects people, it affects communities, it affects the members of our cooperatives, and it affects the business of our cooperatives. Um, underlying those, those turbulent events is the phenomenon of globalization. And globalization is um, not new. It's something that has been around for at least several centuries. Uh, certainly when we think in North America about the way uh, North America has been settled and resettled, how the economy has developed and changed over the years, uh, it's all been about globalization. But there are some differences in recent years. Um, globalization is about changes that are supra-territorial, that come uh, uh, higher than the level of nation states that are shared among many countries in the world. And what they create is uh, what some writers have referred to as a complex connectivity, where many things that go on in our local communities are dependent on events far around the world, um, and in ways we might not even be aware of um, until something new happens. 
Um, these connections are more extensive. They're more aspects of our lives that depend on what happens elsewhere. They're also more intense, that the changes are more dramatic and more far-reaching when they happen. And maybe most of all, what I think everyone notices is that it all happens quicker. The velocity of globalization has increased in recent years. And that's not just since 2008, but the recession since 2008 certainly has made all of this uh, clear in new ways to everybody. You know, when I think about globalization, I think perhaps it's most importantly a cultural phenomenon. It's really about ideas, it's about values, it's about the ways in which people think. And what goes on in markets, how we think about the economy, is just one subset of all those things that are going on. But what goes on in the economy certainly has a really big impact on people and a very large impact on our cooperative enterprises. So economic globalization matters. Uh, one of the important uh, perspectives on economic change in the world today, um, I think, comes from Joseph Schumpeter. And for those of you who don't know him, Schumpeter was a mid-20th century economist, uh, someone of Austrian origin. Um, and I guess he could be characterized as a, as a prophet of innovation. That's the title of one of the biographies of Schumpeter. He's really influential among economists. Um, a very, very um, uh, radical advocate of free enterprise and of unregulated markets. And his comment about uh, the nature of the modern economy, capitalism as he referred to it, is really emphasizing uh, creative destruction as a characteristic of modern economies. Uh, Schumpeter did some of his own economic analysis by looking at the impact of railroad construction in the American Midwest. Um, he was looking in the 19th century at the record of how the building of railroads caused some towns and some industries to flourish, and it destroyed others. So it was that process of creative destruction of things being built while other things are destroyed. That idea of creative destruction, I think, uh, is pretty relevant to what we see going on in the world around us. There are things being destroyed right now. There are things being built. And that's a fundamental characteristic of how our economy has worked. It's an inherently unstable, dynamic, destructive, and creative economy. Now, Schumpeter refers to it as capitalism. I use that term because, uh, because he did. Um, I don't actually like to refer to our economy as capitalist because I think to do so obscures the very large extent to which modern economies are actually also made up of public enterprise and of nonprofit, mutual, and cooperative enterprise. So all of us everywhere in the world live in mixed economies. But there's no denying that the, the profit sector uh, is certainly dominant in the public discourse about economic change. So Schumpeter talked about creative destruction. I think that's what we see going on around us. So when times are tough and challenging, when the world is changing more intensely, when it's changing more quickly, when there is this creation and destruction going on around us, how do people respond to that? What's the impact on their psychology? There's uncertainty, there's anxiety, there's fear of loss of jobs or of loss of things that we value about our communities. And I think in our society in North America, uh, the first response is usually, for most people, an individual one. The individual person or the individual household will try harder to get by, will work harder, uh, find another job, manage finances differently, try to solve it, try to adapt to it. I'm not sure whether that's universally true of all cultures everywhere in the world. It might be. The economists would tend to say it is. But I think it is true of what we see in North America and in many developed countries. When things change, when it's bewildering, people tend to hunker down. They tend to focus on getting by. They tend to focus on their self-sufficiency. When there's huge changes going on, that's often not going to be enough. And I think there's a second, typically a second stage in people's thought processes. So what do you do if you're trying to get by? If you can't make the mortgage payment, if you lose a job? Um, I know, at least in my country, I don't know about in the United States, the second thing that people do is ask the government to fix it. So step in and do something about it. We need a program for that. We have to change a policy, help us out. And the argument that I would make is that after people have done what they can as individuals, after they've asked for uh, uh, the government to step in and help, if all of that has failed, the last thing that people will do is cooperate. <laughs> 
so we, I, I think it's a thought process, but I also think it describes a little bit the role that we see cooperatives in, in developed economies. Cooperatives tend to form where other forms of enterprise, government, industry have failed. Uh, they step in when other institutions don't work. They kind of fill the cracks and help the whole economy do the things that it couldn't do if the co-ops weren't there. But this is also important to think about as a thought process, because if we want to educate members to, uh, to uh, uh, rejoin, to renew, to support cooperatives, then I think we have to think about the thought process that they go through. And if I'm right, and if you agree with me that this is many people's thought process, I think it has implications for what we need to do in our cooperative development. In times of change, people need to be reminded of what we might refer to as strategic interdependence. Uh, we may have thought when times were good that we were getting by pretty well on our own. But times like the last few years are a reminder to all of us that our economic system has limits, that there's things uh, that our welfare individually can't all keep increasing without involving the welfare of others. We're in it together. We can't improve our situation without working together to accommodate the behavior of others. So it takes time for people to think their way through and develop this new way of thinking. It takes time, and that's part of the history of how many of our cooperatives developed in the first place. I also think it's part of the story of how cooperatives will redevelop and renew themselves in current uh, conditions. There's steps involved in this thinking. I think we need to recognize, we need to help our members, help communities recognize that times have changed. The environment is different than it was, and people have to rediscover within a new environment what the value of cooperation really is. To do that will require passion, it will require argument, it will require inspiration, but people also look for evidence. They look for clues that it works, that the ideas that we're talking about are practical and will be successful. It's also important to create a group identity. We often take identity for granted, that the members of a community know who we are, we grew up in the community, it's natural. But in fact, I think group identity is something that is created fresh every day in the interactions that people have with each other, in the communications and education of the cooperative and in its transactions with its members. If you don't have that group identity, you don't have the cohesive group of people who can take action to do something about their circumstances. And for that purpose, I think, you also need to devise group governance so that people can figure out how to work together, how to contribute, and how to have a say. And yesterday, we had a great discussion in a governance workshop about lots of ideas and concerns that I heard from many different cooperatives. But people, in order to work together, have to have protocols for how to do it. There have to be norms. There have to be expectations. There have to be rules for how you get involved. That's also part of how cooperation develops and how cooperation is renewed. So in all of this emphasis on things that change, I guess the other point that's relevant is that there are things, especially for cooperatives, that don't change. This is, uh, or don't change, uh, don't change in their fundamentals. They may change in the forms they take. So we know that uh, when we're looking at people, no matter how global things get, uh, most people live in particular places. They interact with others in particular places. So the impacts of globalization, however general they are, have an impact in specific communities. They're local, and the action, the responses that people take are usually still local as well. Trust, loyalty, connectedness are things that help people work together, and that's just as true in 2011 as it was in 1844 when the Rochdale pioneers formed their early consumer co-op. People need to rediscover cooperation, or in many cases, discover it for the first time under, these, uh, uh, under today's conditions. And that process of discovery or rediscovery will resemble what's gone on in the past in the history of our cooperatives and in the history of other cooperatives. So among all the bewildering variety of things that we might think of that affect cooperatives, what are some of the most important things to keep in mind? I think in many ways it's about members, it's about markets, and it's about the relationship between the two of them. So that's what I want to spend a few minutes talking about this morning. Members are, of course, critical to cooperatives, and globalization, the turbulence in our economy, has lots of impacts on members. Uh, members feel those impacts economically. 
disadvantageously to many of them with the changes we've had in recent years, but, but of course advantageously for some of them. Members become more differentiated because they have different experiences of globalization and its impacts in their communities. And they also have changing attitudes and concerns that will be influenced by what they see going on them and around the world. So members are changing right now as we speak in response to the impacts on our economy and our society. Markets are also changing. Uh, prices are changing, competition is changing. Uh, we heard a little bit about that yesterday as well. Uh, there's a new, uh, a new kind of economy that's developing out there and it has impacts on cooperatives as well as on the members. So this change in members and change in markets can mean a whole lot of change for co-ops because these things are very important to us. I often think about the ICA's definition of a cooperative. I think this is a really important statement. People often talk about the co-op principles, the list of the guidelines that many cooperatives follow. But this is actually the ICA's definition of a co-op. An autonomous association of people united voluntarily to meet common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. And one of the critical things about this definition, one of the things that I think they got right when uh, uh, Professor Ian McPherson and his committee put this definition together, is they put in the word association and they put in the word enterprise. And a cooperative is both those things. Every cooperative everywhere, by definition, is both an association of people, a democratic association, and it's an enterprise. And an enterprise is something that takes risks, it acts in markets of some kind, it's exposed to success and failure, um, and it, uh, it has some kind of a bottom line that it needs to meet. That combination or that dual character of being an association and an enterprise is an important thing to think about when times are changing. Co-ops to be really successful, to be completely successful, need to be successful associations as well as successful enterprises. They need to engage and involve members, have a common sense of identity, but they also have to succeed in markets. And that uh, puts them in an interesting situation when it comes to uh, turbulent economic times. Now, a number of years ago, and I know uh, a, a number of you are familiar with this, I did some thinking about some strategic concepts for guiding um, strategy and planning in cooperatives. And I know some of you have found these uh, to be helpful. They're intended to be, uh, to be helpful. Um, and these are concepts that I defined the way I did uh, because I wanted to get at this interconnection of the association and the enterprise, the business and the membership. So I certainly think it's important, I guess I see when I look at cooperatives, that linkage between the co-op and the members, economic linkage, business linkage, is frequently something that is a sign of a long-lasting and strong and successful cooperative. One of the ways I think about that linkage is when you see a system where the co-op and the members benefit economically from each other's success, that creates a really tight linkage over time. So why do we have uh, patronage refunds, for example, in consumer co-ops? It's a way for the members to know that if the cooperative succeeds and generates a surplus, that they, the members, will benefit from that and will share in it. Not anyone else, but the members will benefit and share in the surplus. I think cooperatives are also about transparency, that members can see how the co-op works, uh, can understand its mechanisms, price mechanisms, governance mechanisms, but they can also see where the co-op fits in the market, what the co-op does for them that wouldn't happen if the co-op wasn't there. That's a really important point. What the co-op does for the members that the members wouldn't have if the co-op wasn't there. For a new co-op, that's an easy thing to put across because people can see the impact when a new cooperative enters a market. If you have a cooperative that's been around for a generation, a generation and a half, starting to turn over the original group of leaders, sometimes it's hard to keep that idea alive because the people who've joined the co-op will tend to take it for granted. They won't realize as easily that if the co-op wasn't there, there's something that they'd be missing. So the only, the only way to keep that idea alive is through education and through engagement of members in decision making. And I think cognition or thinking, strategy, planning in cooperatives is also critical. Organizations think, they perceive changes in their environment, 
they analyze what's going on, they consider options, and they make choices. Every organization does that, but you, know, you can do it better sometimes than other times. And organizations that are very good at sensing change and at responding to it are going to do better when times are changing quickly. So those are some concepts that I think are, are uh, critical in cooperatives. And I think that if anything, these um, uh, ideas like linkage, like transparency, like cognitive processes in organizations are more important in an era of globalization like we have today. So there's examples of this. I mentioned uh, some of them along the way. We see examples of this sort of linkage, transparency, cognitive processes in the economic policies of cooperatives, in the way they develop new services, in the way they renew their identity and make strategic plans. What's different when times are turbulent is the pressure on the co-op uh, from the changes in the markets and the changes in the membership. And I was trying to think of a way to present this visually, and what I came up with uh, was the following. The idea of alignment, that when things are working well, what you've got is members and a co-op that's meeting their needs. You've got a co-op that has a niche in the market and that is economically successful, and it all lines up, that what the members are getting from the co-op is an economically viable, sustainable, successful service uh, that has its place in the market. Uh, you cultivate this alignment in a whole variety of ways. It's about the business, it's about the planning, it's about all of those connections between the co-op and its members and the market on the other side. So when times are good and when the co-op is functioning well, I think that's kind of the picture. But when there's change, I think you can end up in a situation like this. The market has moved on, the co-op is still connected with its members, but it's struggling to find a, 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 an economically viable role. So this is an example where the co-op is uh, an economically successful way of keeping doing something that's important to the members. The members still are connected to the co-op, but the co-op isn't relevant in the market, and eventually, sooner or later, it's likely to struggle financially. I think you can also have this kind of a situation where the co-op moves with the market and leaves the members behind. So here you have an economically successful co-op, but the members no longer understand what it does for them. Uh, it's not tied to them. They don't see the benefit from it. And last of all, I think, of course, you could end up in this situation, which is <laughs> the market's moved on, the members have moved on, the co-op is left behind. So you, could, you don't want to end up there. So what, what do you do in a situation like this? So here's where, you know, I thought of this word stretch, just as Mari did yesterday. But it's a stretch by the co-op to remain connected to the members, to remain connected to the market, and to pull the two together and keep them, keep them connected. So to do this, the co-op's going to have to change somewhat. It's going to have to bring the members along to understand that. And it's going to have to find some new ways to connect to where the market has moved to. So I think turbulent times, right? What does it mean for co-ops? I think for a lot of co-ops, it means stretch, and that means strain, and that means tension, and that means some anxiety as you go through this process. So what's it like to stretch? It involves embracing uncertainty, and I want to talk about the idea of imagination as, a, as an important piece of how we deal with a changing environment. It's about innovations in business. It's about innovations in member education. It's also about organizational identity. And I think most of all, it's about keeping all of that together, moving in the same direction at the same time. So can we innovate in our business? Can we innovate in our membership engagement? Can we do that in a way that remains aligned with a niche in the market that's viable for our co-ops? So I want to give just a few examples and illustrate that uh, with what some cooperatives and some cooperative systems have done around the world in recent years. Um, and I'll, I'll use these examples really to, to make it, uh, to make it uh, reasonably specific in a few cases and then come back and talk a bit more generally about the picture of cooperatives and how cooperatives are changing. So I want to talk a little bit about the cooperative group in the United Kingdom. Um, are any of you already familiar with the co-op group and with what it does? Yeah, so you've heard a number of presentations. I know uh, uh, NCBA has, uh, has brought in some speakers. Yeah, that's good. 
I want to talk a bit about the co-ops in my part of Canada, kind of in the, the, the left half of Canada, if I can put it that way. Um, some changes in credit unions and about something called the social economy that's been an important topic of research for a number of us in Canada and other countries recently. Um, how many of you know the term social economy? So a, a few good, okay, so social enterprise is a related term, not quite the same thing, but there's a, there's a connection between the two. So I'd like to give you some, uh, some examples of what stretch and change have meant for some of these different cooperatives and cooperative groupings. So here's uh, an example of the web page of the cooperative group in the United Kingdom. And I want to talk a bit about uh, where this came from. So of course the UK has had consumer co-ops um, for close to a couple of hundred years. They evolved over time, they changed in many ways. Uh, there were also uh, cooperative banks and other kinds of cooperatives that appeared in British communities over the years. And a number of years back, um, people got together and started thinking about how this was all going to be viable because there were a lot of challenges and there were challenges at that time um, economically, but there were also challenges in terms of member engagement, an important need to reconnect with members and to reconnect with communities. And what they came up with is really interesting. So first of all, they thought about the fact that there's all these different kinds of cooperatives but they don't market themselves together. Each one is separate, and as a result, they're not making the impact on people's awareness that they could. So what they came up with was this sort of common marketing approach. And in the, on the web page here, it's in the top left uh, corner. Uh, uh, the cooperative, good for everyone. So it's a common marketing banner, if you like, for all kinds of cooperation. And underneath that, the different enterprises are assembled together into a group. So you see the tabs across the page, uh, electrical, food, the historic consumer cooperative businesses, uh, bank, travel, pharmacy, funeral care, funeral co-ops are an interesting thing, insurance, and legal services. So this is a, a, a group, so all kinds of needs under a common co-op marketing banner um, and all of it brought together and, uh, and presented to members as a kind of systematic family of cooperative enterprises. The other interesting thing about how uh, the co-op group presents itself in the United Kingdom is that they also present themselves as being good for the community. So that's the other sense of the good for everyone piece. So it's social enterprise of a variety. They, they emphasize the benefits to the community, the support for local causes, uh, support for community development. So it's really a, a, a sort of a, a fair trade, um, social enterprise kind of marketing approach on the behalf of this, uh, this group of, uh, of uh, in many cases, long-standing cooperatives. So this is a reinvention. It's a reconceptualization of how cooperatives work together. It's a reimagination of what they stand for. And it's a whole new way of relating to members and to communities. And that's what a very large and very long established group of cooperatives have been working through uh, in the last number of years. So that's one example. Here's one that's very close to home for me. This is uh, uh, the cooperative retailing system in Western Canada. Um, so these are also consumer cooperatives. Most of them are fairly large regional consumer cooperatives, although they vary immensely in size. So some of the uh, nearly 150 to 200 members of the cooperative retailing system are small local cooperatives, fuel cooperatives in local areas that have trucks that deliver petroleum products to farmers. Some of them are very large regional uh, uh, multifaceted enterprises. So one of the members of the cooperative retailing system is Calgary Co-op. So an independent consumer cooperative in the city of Calgary, couple of dozen branch stores, supermarkets, 440,000 members in that one cooperative. So to my knowledge, that's the largest locally based consumer cooperative um, in North America. So a very wide disparity in membership and they cover a very large region with a total of about 1.5 million members in mostly the four western provinces of Canada. So the story for these co-ops about reimagining themselves um, goes back um, all the way to the last recession in the 1980s and to a series of changes that they've been carrying out ever since. Um, this is a cooperative system that almost went under, um, under pressure of market and loss of support from membership. Uh, their business almost failed on a catastrophic scale. 
which is something that we've seen in a number of countries around the world um, uh, uh, in, uh, in recent decades. What they did to reimagine themselves was to reimagine their identity as a system. Each local cooperative in this system is legally independent. They have their own board, their own CEO, they make their own decisions. But they had to work together much more tightly as a network of cooperatives with a jointly owned central wholesale company. And they worked together in some very important ways. So much better developed, much more effective marketing campaigns where every co-op in the entire group buys into a common marketing campaign around particular products and pricing. Um, they also work together um, uh, in uh, human resource development, in leadership training, in developing managers who move around in the system and provide consistent management among the cooperatives. And finally, they work together economically through central wholesaling and through manufacturing and production. And it's turned out to be very good for this group of cooperatives that one of the things they're involved in is petroleum refining. Um, so that certainly in the last number of decades has been um, a very important business for them to have a foot in. Of course, one of the questions that they have is also where that goes in future decades. In recent years as well, this particular group of cooperatives has also begun to reimagine its connection to community, and they've begun presenting themselves in a different way in terms of their, uh, their, uh, uh, what co-ops stand for and how they connect to other kinds of cooperative enterprises. I guess the point that I really want to make, though, is that this is a system of cooperatives that were fiercely proud of local independence. And they survived, they thrive, they're extraordinarily successful in economic terms particularly, um, and they have done that by learning to work together as a system. That's meant a change in identity. They've had to learn how to have local independence work uh, within a system that's integrated and shared among many cooperatives. So that's an important change and a reimagination of cooperation. Um, this is a credit union in Manitoba. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm a bit of a sucker for cute marketing campaigns, so I have to say, I, I looked at their webpage the other day, and these are their uh, directors of greetings in four of their branches. So, so you know, th th this is really great. I mean, St. Bernard puppies as greeters in four of your credit union branches. Their names are posted on the internet, so just imagine the kids and all the members' families saying, can we go see so-and-so today at the, anyway. It, it's great marketing. <laughs> That's not actually why I want to use them as a case study, but it's, uh, it is very cute. So this is, a, this is a really interesting credit union. It's developed over a period of years uh, to be a multi-branch system of credit unions in an area north of the city of Winnipeg. So Winnipeg's a city of about 500,000 people in Manitoba. Um, these credit union branches that make up Sonova Credit Union are spread across an area that's about um, um, 120 miles wide, about 60 miles north-south, and it is uh, uh, right along the fringe of the metropolitan area. So it has really rural places and really urban places all in a single network of credit union branches. So some of the branches are in fairly remote um, uh, forestry communities where there are pulp mills. Some of them are right in Winnipeg, uh, in, uh, in urban areas. Some are resort cottage communities. So a really diverse set of communities. And this credit union has grown through this area steadily over the years partly by opening new branches, but also, and this is sort of part of the, the globalization story, also by purchasing branches that banks were trying to get rid of. So one of the trends we've seen in banking in Canada is the, the desire by some of our bigger banks to disinvest from communities of different kinds. They wanted to get out, they were happy to sell their branch to the credit union, and this particular credit union bought a number of these branches and overnight, a whole bunch of people who had been customers of a bank became members of a credit union. Very, very interesting transition. And you can imagine some of the, the education that went on. Uh, what's a share? What's an annual meeting? How do you become involved? Of course, not all the members would stay in that kind of conversion. But in a, in a world where we often hear about um, uh, co-ops, or where we sometimes hear about co-ops that get converted to profit enterprises, it's interesting to have one of these examples of a conversion the other way around, where profit enterprises are pulling out and it's co-ops that are taking over. So they, they certainly uh, grew in that particular way. And I think what's especially interesting about this, uh, this credit union is the change in identity that's involved in becoming a regional system. 
So the credit union has a collective identity across this large region, but it's a pretty generic identity, right? This isn't, uh, this isn't a, a really distinctive presence on the web. The identity that matters is actually the identity of each individual branch, and that's expressed in a variety of ways. So in one of the agricultural communities where the credit union has a branch, their, uh, their branch is set up, decorated um, uh, agricultural equipment out front, caters to the local community. Uh, in another community that's uh, the cottage and resort community, uh, the co-op is on the harbor, it's uh, fitted out inside like a cabin. Um, and each of these branches has considerable autonomy in how it relates to its immediate local community. So the members perceive the branch as being their credit union. They see it as a locally based enterprise. They see it as a business that's responsible to their immediate community, even though the legal uh, uh, cooperative is actually a large regional organization. So, um, with uh, a number of collaborators, I went in and did interviews in this credit union. We heard very interesting things. So we heard from the members that they see the cooperative, the credit union as being part of their community, supporting local causes, uh, charities, social events. We heard from the staff that they experienced the credit union as being completely different from the bank. Of course, we got to talk to staff members who had worked for banks and who kept working for the credit union and who could directly compare the experiences. And what they told us is that in the bank, everything was run out of head office. It was all rules and regulations. Uh, there was no room, no, uh, no flexibility for the staff. So as one of them uh, told us, when they, they found themselves working for a cooperative, uh, their experience was, I felt like I had found myself, which is a really interesting statement to make from the point of view of the, the staff culture in the, in the co-op. And the managers found a difference too, because as branch managers in the credit union, they found that they had a degree of autonomy to be involved in their local community, to run their branch in a particular way that was far greater than the autonomy that they'd had in the bank. So this system, this regional identity, this combination of regional and local works for the members, it works for the staff, it works for the managers, and it clearly distinguishes the credit union from its competitors. So that's another change that has to do with questions of identity. Now I mentioned the social economy. The social economy is a new way of thinking. It's one of a number of new ways of thinking about groupings of different kinds of enterprises. Uh, this is a term uh, that is uh, perhaps best associated with Italy, uh, with France, with Spain, with a number of other countries. In Canada, certainly with Quebec and with developments in the province of Quebec. But the term is increasingly widely used in other countries as well, both by researchers and by community leaders and activists. It includes uh, traditional co-ops. It includes a, a field of work that has uh, often been referred to as community economic development, so economic development corporations and initiatives in local communities. It includes uh, nonprofit enterprises and mutuals, um, and it often um, uh, is uh, considered to include as well for-profit enterprises that have a distinct social mission. Um, so there's, uh, there's many different components in here, and by looking at social economy, we're also looking at things other than kind of traditional cooperatives. This, uh, this uh, set of enterprises are characterized by um, a high degree of networking, by alliances of different kinds of cooperatives and different kinds of enterprises and community activists and associations. So it's a coalition kind of approach. And many of the cooperatives that are founded within this, uh, this group are multi-stakeholder cooperatives. And I know later on uh, today's workshop agenda, Margaret Lund is doing a, section on, a session on solidarity cooperatives, multi-stakeholder cooperatives, and I think there's an opportunity to talk about it there. But the essential idea in a multi-stakeholder cooperative is that there's more than one class of membership. So in most consumer cooperatives, the members are all members in their capacity as consumers. The board is made up of consumer representatives. In multi-stakeholder cooperatives, employees are often a separate membership category, often with their own dedicated seats on the board of directors. And community supporters are frequently another distinct membership category. So people in the community who want to support the cooperative but aren't themselves users of its services. Um, that's very important, by the way, when you have cooperatives that are founded to assist um, uh, socially marginalized groups, uh, people with intellectual disabilities, uh, people who are difficult to employ because they've recently been released from prison, 
these are some of the populations that social uh, uh, cooperatives, that uh, uh, solidarity cooperatives work with. And often that involves a partnership of agencies and supporters with the users and clients. So a very different way of thinking about cooperatives. Um, in Canada, at least, and to some extent in other parts of the world, uh, most of these um, uh, multi-stakeholder cooperatives have emerged in areas of health and social services. There are quite a few in the area of food. I'll show you one in a moment. Um, and as well in recreation, in tourism, in arts and entertainment. So a very interesting section of uh, organizations in the economy that are different than traditional cooperatives. So I thought you might be interested in one uh, that had a food focus. This is one that's in Montreal, La Maison Verte, um, uh, the Green House, uh, which is a community-based cooperative. It has an ecological focus, so its purpose is to provide environmentally friendly products and services, including food. They, offer, they run a cafe in the store. It's connected to community shared agriculture pro projects. Uh, but it's a multi-stakeholder cooperative because they have three membership classes. So three members of their board are consumer representatives, three are worker representatives, and three are community supporters um, who uh, are uh, members of the cooperative. Uh, this particular cooperative has about 8,000 members in total um, and is, uh, is a, a pretty typical example of, uh, of what uh, we see in the social economy in Quebec today. Um, it was founded in about 1999. That's when a lot of these social economy enterprises began to be founded in our part of the world. So it has about 10 years of experience in what it's doing. Um, I also wanted to show you one other example. Um, so I, this one I wanted to, uh, to uh, uh, show you because uh, I'm actually a member of this one. This is a cooperative in the university town of Leuven in Belgium, or uh, Louvain, if you, uh, if you prefer the French. Um, uh, and it's uh, World Café, and this is a cooperative or a social enterprise that's founded uh, based on the idea of solidarity between the global north and the global south. So the purpose is to bring together in a single organization people who are Belgians, who live in Leuven, and also people who are connected to and come from all kinds of other parts of the world. And in the case of, uh, of Leuven, that mostly means people from Africa and people from Asia, some of whom are there for the university and some for other reasons. So its purpose is global solidarity. And in order to um, uh, fulfill that purpose, what they do is they, they have uh, a bar, they have food, it serves as a social center and network for the town and brings people together from these different communities. So I think that's also an interesting example um, of, uh, of a small, uh, fledgling uh, social enterprise and the way in which it's inspired by global ideas and by change. So those are a few examples, and I guess I want to, to finish up here uh, by just uh, giving a bit of a conceptual overview then of given examples like those, what are some of the things that are going on in cooperatives around the world? How can we generalize about what we see in cooperatives? So there are changes in cooperative identity that we've seen, and we've seen many of these over the years. I guess I'd predict we'll see more of them in years to come. Cooperatives change in their membership, and if you look at the British consumer cooperatives, they changed from being founded as being about labor and about laborers to be about consumers today. That's a shift over time. In my part of the world, co-ops that were created for farmers have become community co-ops that are for everybody. When you think about it, that's a total change in the character of a cooperative. It's a change in who it's for, and it's a change in why it exists. And members change, and co-ops embrace new differences among the membership. One of the changes that we see, and it's important to mention it, is that some cooperatives change by leaving their membership and their members behind completely. So we do hear about demutualizations in cooperatives. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I guess I'd hold that out to you. Uh, if members no longer see a need for a cooperative and don't want to keep it, then maybe they should let go of it. But demutualization is certainly a tragedy if it happens without uh, the members actually having an opportunity to, uh, to have a say in the matter. Co-ops also change their lines of, lines of business. They can change 100% what business they're in, and there are examples of that among cooperatives. One that I um, find really striking is the consumer cooperatives in communist East Germany uh, after 1989 had to figure out how to function in a Western-style economy. 
um, those consumer cooperatives had existed under uh, communist rule, but in a system of central planning, they weren't free to act like we usually associate cooperatives acting. So it was a real shock for them when the world changed for them rather drastically with the introduction of a Western-style market economy. Some of them made the transition and exist today as consumer cooperatives. They operate stores. Um, and I guess you might say that if a cooperative can survive the transition from communism to capitalism in a few short years, then cooperatives can do almost anything. Uh, but others of them discovered that they actually could not uh, sustain a business in retailing. Uh, the, the new rules in the market were just too difficult to adjust to. Their stores were not profitable. They had to completely reimagine what they could do that would be for the benefit of their members and their communities. And what occurred to them is that while their stores were losing money and had to be closed, they did own assets that were in the middle of German cities. And those buildings, those properties, were now kind of valuable. So a number of them reorganized themselves as housing and real estate development organizations uh, to help develop property uh, for the, the benefit of their local community and their membership. So it's a, that's a pretty drastic example, but I think it shows that you can change 100% what line of business a co-op is in, uh, but it's still a co-op. It's still an association of people. Um, we see a lot of changes in co-ops that are about new kinds of networking and new kinds of combinations. And I actually have talked about this in the examples that I gave you. So co-ops can merge the sort of supporting functions. The locals can stay independent, while central functions of wholesaling, of production, of marketing, of human resources can be centralized in a central cooperative organization. So that's what our consumer co-ops in Western Canada have done. What the credit union was doing that I described to you is uh, more like the second bullet. Our credit unions have actually dragged their feet about forming strong central financial organizations. Um, they've talked about it, they've done some of it, but it's been more a case that the individual credit unions have gotten bigger rather than that the central organizations have gotten stronger. So here we see um, credit unions that used to be one credit union per town linking together into very large geographic networks um, and getting that economy of scale from sort of the front end organization rather than the back end. Um, I'd also mention non-territorial cooperatives. This is an interesting, interesting thing to think about. So cooperatives whose existence is national in scope or transnational, globalized cooperatives, cooperatives that particularly interact over the internet. We have seen some of that. Um, I guess the odds are we'll see more of it in future years. Um, in Canada, one of our examples of that would be a mountain equipment co-op, which I guess is sort of a, a counterpart to REI in the United States, but a consumer cooperative in our case that spans the entire country. It has almost no geographical center. Um, and we have examples in Europe as well of globalized cooperatives that cross national boundaries. So there's all kinds of changes that can occur in network networking and new combinations. We also see hybrid forms. So we think, you know, there's a traditional model of what a co-op is about, but in today's world, everything is up for grabs. People are trying all kinds of different combinations. So one thing that is interesting is when you see cooperatives open branches or subsidiaries that are not themselves cooperatives. So that's an interesting kind of hybrid form. Um, a health cooperative in uh, my city is a consumer health cooperative primarily. It has members, it has a central clinic where the members come, but they faced a challenge a number of years ago to figure out how to serve um, an economically and socially marginalized part of the city, an area with a high uh, First Nations and Aboriginal population, um, uh, high turnover in the population, transients, people who only lived in the city for part of the year. And they concluded that a conventional membership model wouldn't work because you couldn't engage people in that way under those kinds of, uh, of, uh, of conditions. So they opened their, uh, their branch really just as a satellite of the main office um, and not as a membership-based structure to provide services to everybody in the neighborhood and not only to members. So that's a hybridization of the co-op model. It's an adaptation uh, to a local circumstance. There are many other forms. Um, you can think about mixed forms between co-ops and for-profit. One that I find intriguing is that in a number of places um, I know in Quebec, 
they've formed what are called shareholder cooperatives. So this is uh, uh, typically where a group of employees in a share company buy shares. So it's a for-profit company, but the employees are buying shares, and they're forming a cooperative to vote their shares together rather than individually. So it's a co-op inside a for-profit corporation. There's also hybrids with government, and here I might mention um, uh, uh, cooperatives that are adapted to particular circumstances on our First Nations uh, reserves in, uh, in Western Canada. And I don't know if Lou Hammond Kettleson is in the room, but she actually has done the research on this. Lou's over there. Can't see you in the dark there, Lou. So t you should talk to Lou about this particular adaptation. So one of the issues in First Nations communities is that there's a strong tradition of uh, tribal or First Nation self-governance, where the businesses, the property, the enterprises on the reserve are all connected with the band structure, with effectively with the First Nations government. So when you come into an environment like that, you want to create a co-op, and you say the co-op is only for members. Some people join and other people don't. And the co-op is only for those who join, right? You're starting to introduce an idea that's alien to the expectations of the people in the community, that it would actually create a division in the community to have a co-op that's serving only some of the population and not others. So one of the adaptations that people are looking at is cooperatives that are linked to and based on the band governance so that everybody would be a member and the co-op would serve the entire community. That's a pretty fundamental adaptation of the cooperative model. Um, there's a number of other interesting examples about how cooperatives participate in the governance of sectors of the economy. Uh, forestry is a business that's dominated by multinationals, uh, but particularly in Quebec, one of the things that uh, some researchers found there who worked on a research project uh, with our center um, is that forestry cooperatives actually provided a voice for owners of small woodlots and for worker-owned firms within this sector that's dominated by government and by huge corporations. Uh, it's public policy that enables them to do so because the government uh, basically specified that there had to be some room left for these cooperatives. But the cooperatives become a conversation partner who can talk to the multinationals, to the government agencies, um, and participate in the policy and the governance of the whole uh, natural resources sector. So each co-op is individually a conventional co-op, but the way they participate in this bigger governance is a, is a kind of a hybrid model. We see all kinds of other uh, reinventions of cooperatives in the world. Um, certainly we see new kinds of cooperatives. Uh, we see new cooperatives in particular localities. And you heard Anne mentioned earlier that there are something like a billion people in the world who are members of cooperatives. What that means is that almost anything you can think of, people will have organized as a co-op somewhere in the world. So in that sense, whatever seems new in your community, probably someone in India or in Italy or in South America has already done it. So in that particular sense, there's nothing new. But in each part of the world, there are types of, of cooperatives that are new to us locally. So in Canada, uh, cooperatives in the social services, home care, and health sectors are comparatively new. We've seen some upsurge in worker cooperatives. There have been interesting things happening with housing cooperatives, um, uh, child care cooperatives in a number of cases. So there are co-ops that are new to particular places even though they've been done somewhere else. But there's also brand new kinds of cooperatives. And when people invent a new kind of cooperative, I find that very, very intriguing. I've talked about the multi-stakeholder cooperatives. You may know about the idea of new generation cooperatives in agriculture. Um, so the idea of cooperatives that have a much higher capital investment, um, that have differential investment by members who use the cooperatives to different degrees, a, a very fundamental reimagining of the cooperative idea. Now, I have to tell you, I'm, I don't think all of these things will work, or they won't all work equally well. One of the fascinating things is going to be to see what actually thrives in the years ahead. Um, I, I, economies evolve, cooperatives evolve. And the definition of evolution is variation with differential reproductive success, right? Variation with differential reproductive success. What we see among cooperatives right now is variation. We're in a period of intensified variation and differentiation, experimentation with new models, 
hybridization, people inventing things new, people adapting fundamental cooperative ideas and principles and trying things uh, that are completely different from how we thought about cooperatives just a little while ago. That variation is going to produce all kinds of things that will thrive and will spread. It will probably produce other things that don't thrive or spread very far. It's going to be a very interesting few years in the years ahead. So when we think about uh, reinvention of cooperatives, cooperatives around the world are reinventing themselves. There are all kinds of new forms and experimental forms. There's, uh, and I guess I'd say simply change is the new normal. Change is the new normal. It's, a, it's always been there, but it's more intense than ever before. But in looking at change, we can also go back to the fundamentals. And for cooperatives, the fundamentals will always have something to do with members and with markets. There's a number of things we can do to promote the alignment and the success of co-ops. We can seek to innovate both in the associative aspects of our cooperatives and in the business aspects. We can strengthen economic linkage with members, increase transparency, develop the cognitive processes, uh, make our co-ops smarter uh, through, their, uh, through their planning and their, uh, their uh, governance. We can engage our stakeholders, and what it all comes to is reimagining cooperation. Imagination matters to cooperatives. Uh, what might be the best for the current generation of cooperatives may not be suited to the generation to come or to the circumstances that we're going to see in five or ten years. Imagination is what allows us to anticipate um, how our members will change, how our communities will change, how our cooperatives will change. Imagination is what allows us to keep up. Imagination is what will allow our cooperatives to help create what comes next. So I want to leave you with that thought. I think all of us in cooperatives are imaginative people. And I know that every time I attend a conference like this one, I hear new things, new ideas, new concerns that people have. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.